Thank you much for coming and uh, investing your time into this activity. So we are in the computational chemistry, like introductory computational chemistry course. With uh, this meeting, we are completing the chapter on Hodge-Fock theory from uh, theory side and uh, practical skills on uh, using Gauss view and, and Gaussian for basic level electronic structure calculations. And uh, the general idea is that uh, if instructor mumbles something, it's boring. But if you see uh, any instructions from your uh, class members, you remember it much better. And another idea is that uh, one cannot learn everything perfectly, uh, but one can mm, get mastership in a specific skill and then share with others uh, history of uh, failures and uh, success so that uh, the rest repeat success and, and avoids failures. So um, if um, so, yeah. so here, here is the uh, list of subjects and, and uh, presenters. So they are arranged from um, basic ways how to uh, they, they uh, combine launching software and analyzing, looking on different observables that uh, you may need to characterize uh, molecules and materials in your real uh, research work. And uh, it goes um, for more and more visual as we go uh, down to the table. If you never saw Microsoft Windows, uh, then it is here. If you <laughs> if you have never seen uh, uh, PowerPoint, um, it is also here. And um, all talks are labeled. They are placed on this desktop, and they are uh, organized in uh, space and in names. So the one, two, three, four, five, five, five A, five B, just because it was last uh, minute change of the order. And there are also names, uh, primarily first. Some some of them are last. So just uh, double click, right? Yes. And you have the most updated version of that? I hope so. OK. If you do not see right version, do not panic and uh, mumble something, because if you will start re-uploading the versions, uh, we will be killed here. Just it, it will take too long time. Uh, use your charismatic approach. <laughs> so uh, double click on uh, the uh, presentation. It will pop up. And then there is a. A uh, little symbol here that you uh, uh, launch this presentation. So, with and, and here is the advancer with uh, laser pointer at this point. Right, right. This one, this top of the button is uh, laser pointer, left, right for going uh, forward backwards to the slides. Uh, if you fear that uh, your voice is not strong enough, you can mount a microphone or talk louder. <laughs> Here. And with this, let me invite to the stage Anas, who will tell us any options about And uh, if you like to be recorded, then see if you see yourself. If you want to avoid, if you hesitate, you can just. I'll be good here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. Yeah. Please, please start. Yeah, so uh, today my topic is the electronic structure. Many of you have a not well good idea about the electronic structure. So if you have some great questions, we can always try to answer with the help of geometry. Uh, so. What information we will get from the electronic structure, that's important. So this is very self-explanatory uh, slide. We can calculate a bunch of information from the electronic structure, including uh, uh, the total energy, entropy of the system, and the QSAR properties, <coughs> its uh, hydration energy, refractivity, refractivity polarizability, 
and we can also calculate the electronic properties like the homo lumo and the vibrational spectrum. These are the sum of the uh, properties we can calculate from the electronic properties, but there are many. But uh, because of the limited space, I just put only few. Uh, the reference which I used is uh, which is hidden by the screen. The reference when I try to uh, use the Avogadro, uh, sorry, the Hypercom software, the semi-empirical electronic structure helped me to calculate these properties. So if you really look the list of uh, different electronic properties, we could see uh, a distribution of uh, different uh, types of uh, electronic property, starting from the molecular mechanics. <laughs> You win, you win. Yeah, so starting from the molecular mechanics, semi empirical, HF, heterophoc, DFT, and two perturbation uh, theory based one, and CCS, uh, SD, and BD, which I have no idea. Which, uh, But this all can be uh, found in the tab uh, on, the, on the method. Yeah, so uh, Dimitri has given a good lecture about the Hattery Fork method uh, during last lectures. It's basically an uh, approximation for determination of the wave function and energy of the content system in stationary state means in the uh, time independent state. So the objective of the HF system is to solve the uh, Schrodinger equation, assuming the PO von Oppenheimer approximation. So wave function, a wave function of the system can be solved uh, uh, by using the single slatter determinant. So single slatter is given by, uh, the wave function is equal to the metric the determinant. And uh, this is another uh, electronic method, which is known as semi empirical So it's based on HF formalism, uh, trip of uh, formalism. But the beauty of this is that uh, it can go for calculate the large molecules, and uh, the approximation is based on some empirical data also. And due to uh, uh, elect uh, re ignoring the electronic electron repulsion, uh, the calculation is a bit faster here. And different subdivision of this semi empirical is AM1, RM1, PM1 uh, methods. This again uh, I have taken with the reference of this, uh, from the Hypercom software. And uh, this is another electronic method I think uh, come uh, the next coming session we are going to have very detailed discussion on this uh, density functional theory. Uh, it's uh, unlike the other two HF and F semi empirical, this is based on electronic density, electron density uh, method. And here, uh, electron density again is a function of uh, space and time, and it's a very fast calculation because only the three uh, Cartesian system has been included. <coughs> the beauty of this uh, uh, DFT is that it can predict uh, a spectrum of properties including the uh, molecular structures, vibrational frequencies, ionization energy, etc., which I think we would have a very detailed discussion in the coming classes. Uh, so how to, uh, how to calculate the electronic structure in a first view? That's the uh, that's important uh, part of the discussion today. So if you open the first view software, go to the calculate uh, tab there, on clicking on that, it will take us to the method. And again, uh, clicking on the method, it will sh uh, pop up another uh, tab which uh, lists uh, many electronic structures, starting from semi empirical, mechanical, uh, DFT, etc. So we can choose the required electronic uh, structures from the uh, this list of. Uh, 
list of electronic structures. So this is uh, another uh, uh, arrangement of uh, precision versus the cost arrangement of electronic, uh, electronic structures. Uh, the best electronic structure is one uh, listed. It is perturbation-based one in, t in terms of precision. And uh, but uh, <coughs> same time MP2, uh, the perturbation of MP2 uh, based electronic structure is co is cost is high. So it's listed uh, on the best and the least. But I'm winding up my talk. Thank you. Okay, but thank you, Anna. <laughs> Any questions? Meat has meat was first. Sorry. Yep. Uh, so when we have DFT versus hard free bar, do you know if uh, that would those methods would give us different electronic and uh, physical values? Like on the first slide, you showed us yep. the, the different values that we could get. So would they change much? Uh, I have to get the help of uh, Dimitri Mike. You know, so DFT. I, I was thinking, do you repeat the question? For a DFT and hard free clock, if you were to use either one, would you get different uh, electronic values and physical values? The things that he showed in the first slide? Yes. So they would be. Uh, uh, we went yeah, com computed, but as before, we used about two times the other. And yeah, so is that still referring to both physical and electronic properties? Or when get corresponds to the color of the transfer. So uh, whatever is uh, red is hard to copy in the field. Makes sense? Would that be the only noticeable difference that we know of? Uh, what else could be more local and more spread over in the field? What is QSAR? Yeah, QSAR is... Yeah, what is that? Yeah, is the yeah. QSAR, I think I, I showed... We didn't even talk about that. Yeah, yeah. What is QSAR? So basically, it's a quantitative structure and uh, activity relationship properties. Uh -huh. uh, it's basically uh, the same modeling what we do in the Russell lab. It's, uh, it's a basically a software which helps to calculate the molecular data into the some mathematical information. Okay, is yeah. this like molecular dynamics or is this quantum theory? No, not dynamic. It's a molecular descriptor basically. Just a descriptor. Yeah. Okay. And log P is some sort of mathematical Mathematical. Okay. Thank you. More questions? More questions? One? More questions? One? More questions? Three? Thank you. If there are no questions, let's thank Anna once again. And the next presenter is uh, Benjamin Jeffrey, who will um, enlighten our understanding about the basic set that we all have seen when uh, we are trying to uh, do any setup of operations with those new, there is a choice of basic set. So what it is, how to deal with it. Hello, so we're gonna be talking about basis sets and as with most of the subjects in this class, you could probably do a thesis paper on it, but this is, no thesis paper. This is going to be a three to five minute presentation. <laughs> so, what is a basis set? You know, generally, a basis set is simply a set of vectors that span a space or that can be used to define any space. But for us, basis sets are sets of single electron functions that are used to build molecular orbitals. In other words, we use linear combinations of atomic orbitals to create our molecular orbitals. And there's a few different ways that we can approach this. So we can use these things called Slater type orbitals, we could use Gaussian type orbitals, or we can use contracted Gaussian type orbitals. So looking at the difference, because no, the equations aren't the important part, it's the shape. So comparing the Slater and Gaussian, Slater is very pointed and peaked. This better represents actual electron density around a charge compared to the Gaussian, which is flatter on top, which is a problem because we want to use Gaussian because Gaussian 
is a lot easier to use and a lot easier to do mass with than Slater type orbitals, which is where the third type, contracted Gaussian type orbitals, come into play, and that covers it up. It's on <laughs> it's on your little sheet of paper, but essentially we use two or more Gaussian orbitals to create a Slater-like orbital to make it somewhat more pointed. So there's a few different nomenclatures, and I can't cover all of them, but we'll cover three of the more significant ones. There's the minimal basis sets, which are single basis function used for each orbital. That is that we approximate every single orbital using one equation. The most common type are the STONG, where this N here is some number. And what this means is, well, we go back here, this is actually our contracted Gaussian type orbitals, where this N indicates how many Gaussian functions we are adding together to create that Slater type orbital, with STO meaning Slater type orbital. There's the Popple basis sets, which have N, M, L, G nomenclature. Each of these N, M, L, those are different numbers indicating different minimal basis sets that are used individually and applied individually to the inner orbitals, small valence, and large valence orbitals. For example, S631G, for example, well, the inner orbitals would use six Gaussian functions for their Slater type orbital. The smaller valence orbitals would use three, and the large and larger valence orbitals would use one. And then, thirdly, we have the correlation consistent basis sets, CCPVXZ, where X can be D, T, Q, five, six. This is correlation consistent polarized valence X zeta. And X zeta is something that I neglected to mention earlier. It's basically, your zeta is, if I understood it correctly, is how many terms you actually have. Like how many basis functions you actually use for any particular orbital. So this D would be double, T would be triple, Q would be quadruple, five, six, et cetera. And so taking a look at actually how we use this in Gaussian, here's a list of all the basis sets that Gaussian 16 can accept. Do, do we actually have Gaussian 16 or Gaussian 9? Gaussian on the semester is 16. Okay. Well, on like what we use. Okay, so it's mostly applicable. So we have your you know, your minimal basis sets up here. We have you know your CCs. Um, we also have LANL two DZ, which stands for Los Alamos National Laboratory Double Zeta, and then. This is, you know, what each of the basis functions is valid for. And that's it. Okay, that's it, man. Oh, we need this first again. Uh, okay. When it comes to those basis sets, are you saying you use three to create like a Cartesian coordinate system or? Um, they specifically said that they're non-orthogonal vectors, yep. and so you don't use orthogonal vectors, you don't use your unit vectors, you use different ones. Okay. So, so the basis vectors we're using in this case are atomic orbitals? Yes. 
So you use like Slater type orbitals for what uh, like uh, electron is close to the nucleus, but though when it gets further out, you use Gaussian. Um, those Slater and Gaussian are. I I kind of regret putting the transition, in, <laughs> but <laughs> Slater and Gaussian are two different ways of approximating the atomic orbitals that we are going to use to approximate our molecular orbitals. So we don't like actively change them, or at least not in this case. I'm sure that if you wanted to, you could create a basis function that actively changes what type of orbital we use as we get further out. I'm sure someone has thought of that, but we don't do that, or at least not for any of these. So. so just to clarify, the basis sets we're using in this class are just atomic orbitals or molecular orbitals? The basis sets use linear combinations of atomic orbitals to create the molecular orbitals. Okay. More questions? Oh, okay. Why is the Gaussian type preferred? Um, because because of this square, this R squared here. Well, I think I forgot a negative sign. Yeah, I forgot a negative sign. Okay. So if we were to integrate. What do you mean, tell that your alpha is negative? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> My alpha is negative in this case, which is important. So if we were to like integrate these two functions, if we were to try to take the integral of e to the negative r compared to the integral of e to the negative r squared. e to the negative r squared, that's a very well-known integral. Meanwhile, you can't actually take the integral directly of e to the negative r. So, what's the little n in r to the um, this is an index that corresponds to some quantum number. I don't remember which one. What would be the n for uh, s orbital? Um, one. Okay, so you get fewer uh, exponential. Yes. What would be the value of n for p orbital? That would be two. Okay, and then you do the power, first power, r times exponential. That would uh, reproduce p of those. Make sense? Okay. More questions? If no, let's thank Ben once again. <laughs> and guess who is the next presenter? Uh, each, huh? <laughs> yes. <coughs> so each uh, new uh, present on the uh, uh, available tasks, so it is uh, a practically important uh, question for modern and properties of modern materials. And we are just two minutes behind the hard deadline. Uh oh. Don't worry, I'll fix that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, so basically just a continuation of my last presentation on what you can do in Gauss View. So for starters, everything that I do here revolves around opening a calculation menu for this, so just right click, calculate, Gaussian function, and so. Uh, so the first job type we're looking at is uh, energy, which it defaults to, so that's nice and easy. So you just run that job, and you open up the results window, go to summary. What it does is it'll open up this little window here, which might kind of be hard to see on here and on paper, but it gives the, the file name type, how it was calculated here, which would be the single point energy, the basis that we use, to yeah, give the energy of so negative 229 atomic units. Uh, here's my last presentation. I have the corrupted benzene model. I went to optimize it this time. And it's now fixed. Uh, frequency, which gives us a few things here. Again, frequency opening up the menu. Uh, and again, you right click and open it up. Vibrations will only show up if you do the frequency calculations. You have to do the frequency calculations for it to show up. It could show up, I guess. And we don't 
care about those numbers right now. I'll get to those in a second. Um, so you can actually show how it vibrates by starting the uh, animation, but because I can't really show that in the PowerPoint, I also turn on the displacement vector so you can see where it's moving. Not terribly well on this one, but you can see the arrows here, so that shows how it's kind of moving. Just pretend it's smoother. Uh, now back to the uh, numbers that I to, to do. ignore. Um, so we can open up the IR spectrum here, make sure it has kind of blown up a bit. And if you notice the uh, peak right here, you look back on the numbers, where the IR shoots up is at 784, which is right about where that is on the spectrum. I kind of see another one here at about 1136. That's, that's the little one. And the other one should be showing up. I just didn't really want to scroll that far. And it actually gives you a few more spectra than just IR. So you have Raman, the and P, and U to polarization. Okay, that's what I got. OK, that's good. Questions? You are the champion of questions. Do you know if that spectrum was the same thing that he showed? The spectrum? Calculated just with different colors. I didn't understand the question. Maybe the speaker did. My apologies. Yeah, it's kind of, I sent it to him. But I know Nav showed a spectrum thing earlier. Do you know is that the same thing between what you showed and what he showed? Because that would be two different programs, obviously calculating the same thing. I was just wondering. Okay, I have to look at no, that. No, it's good. Good. Yeah, I have to look at that one again. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. More questions? So, definition, what is normal mode? Uh, I thought that was on a later presentation. Huh? I thought that was in a later presentation. <laughs> but you are already computing them. You may try your best. I may have been accidentally computing them. <laughs> yeah, but you you were even visualizing them. Oh, we're talking about the vibrations, aren't we? Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, there is a, a contest competition, Dance Your PhD. And you get price and free ticket to Australia. Do it. I need to. So what is normal mode? How, how it vibrates, rather. But why there are many normal modes? Why, why you, you show a list of them? Well, there are different ways the molecule can vibrate, like back to forth, side to side, you know, like that. And why they have different frequencies? The molecules want the different frequencies. Okay. Yeah. Good. It's a good starting point, yes. yes. More questions to Gage? Um, you don't need to answer if you are not comfortable, but try. Um, your normal modes show list is so long, with like 10, 20, 100, and your infrared spectrum has maybe like 4 gigs or more. Why not every normal mode contributes to uh, infrared spectrum? I'm um, assuming because at most points it's not really responding to that, it's only picking up at a few of these points here. At that point it's barely picking up to the point where if it wasn't surrounded by zeros, I'd be inclined to ignore it. But um, just your, your vision, what is responsible for one or another type of uh, molecular motion? What is responsible for contributing or not contributing to uh, interaction with light? So can we meet in the infrared radiation? Spins? Huh? No. No, no. But you can answer. <laughs> I think. Transition. Not right? Not enough. Not enough. OK. We do it. <laughs> so what is the uh, Hamiltonian of interaction between light and matter? Um, Nathan and Kim? You do, you do. 
Right, can you repeat the question? What is the Hamill's joining of interaction between light and matter? Between light and matter? Yes, between the electric field and, and uh, any material object. Uh, the, uh, the gradient squared uh, plus. Uh, Simple. The Simple. Much simpler. The electric field strength E times. Uh, Q? If it is if it is charged system. And if system is neutral. Oh, it's a zero. No. It's a little puddle. We will need it later in the course. Sorry for stopping us from this uh, bonus uh, journey. So if 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 you if your molecule is neutral and you irradiate with light, it still may respond, right? Because you have so many neutral molecules. Even infrared frequency. So you have motions of molecule create imbalance of charge so that it, from the bird's view it's neutral. But some portions of molecule have delta plus, some delta minus, and they form diagonal. So those bending with, with uh, distortions that create dipole will respond to electric field. Does that have something to do with the polarization that it uses? It is related. It is not direct, but it is related. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. A small value less than one. So okay, if, if Q plus Partial. is is the charge, what's uh, it? What what is it when it's neutral then? Huh? If, if Q Q is the for charge, right? We didn't answer what it was for. What oh, if if you have like a hydrogen atom, yeah, you have plus one for uh, nuclei and minus one for. Mm -hmm. But uh, there could be like, dipole. Okay. 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 Electric field. Electric field. Yes. But uh, we probably are done with questions to Gage. More questions to Gage? If not, let's thank you once again. Also, thank you for answering the question. <laughs> All right, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about normal modes, scan reaction coordinates, and transition state search within Gaussian 09. Okay, cool. All right. So what we have here is there's some pretty famous kind of you know interesting studies. They're very hard to study. Um, I got this guy to work. Whether he's representative or not, we'll get there. So if you take methane, this is not methane, but if you take methane, you, you interact with oxygen you might get some type of combustion reaction. So we'll see if we can get that here. This is the closest thing I got to, to up. Just in, in, in the, what, what's the name of this compound? Uh, I mean, it would I, just I be David Kraut. So I, I'm not asking you for a second, because okay. I'm confident in you. Anyone else? Yes. So it's, um, uh, and what, it, what will be the name if it will be uh, CH2 group between uh, this red oxygen and uh, CH3 group? Nothing? No, no, no. If, if there will be, uh, right now it is CH3OH, and what it will be if it, will, if it is C2H5OH? Yeah. Yes. Which is like. Uh, I so, uh, and th this is uh, toxic, although some, some people consider it as a substituent, but you don't want to get blind after it. Yeah, don't drink it. So, okay. <laughs> um, so, I got this guy to work. Yes, because it took me forever. But So, what we go ahead and do is, this guy's already optimized here. So, I can open this up in a separate file. Um, open this guy up. Hit scan. And then we want to make sure that the redundant coordinates are relaxed. Pay attention to your little message at the bottom because we need to fix our redundant coordinate or go to our redundant coordinate editor. So next step is open, while everything's open, just go to your edit, go down to here, 
and then you'll still have your molecule open and you're going to select add so then you go down to the list area you'll have some options click down here hit bond and then you need to actually literally select the bond so one corresponding to six for example and two would be five then this is where you need to play around because it, it can do weird things. I just decided to take a low amount of steps because it actually worked. When I did more steps, it wouldn't converge. So I just decided to go low and it worked. Let's see here. Um, whoop. Yeah. Okay, we'll go back. So this is uh, from when you optimize successfully, you get the file and you open it or you look in the Gauss, Gauss view and you can pull down the scan you click it and it produces this chart. And so you have the scan of total energy and you have the scan, <sighs> I'm not sure what RMS stands for, but this is the gradient norm, so. Uh, any, anyone? Root mean squared? That's what, okay. So this is the options you have to produce uh, this graph. It's nothing too sh shocking, you know, it gets down to this Energy. Wait, uh, Go back. Uh, why, why is your graph different from what I have on the paper? On yours? Oh, oh I'm sorry, because I uh, had trouble optimizing and I was given a, a, a small extension. Okay. <laughs> I, so, so yes, when you see on the paper is not correct. Okay. Uh, this is my most updated one. So. Because I was not able to, to print, like after I just went for printing, it was too late. Yeah. Okay. So if you actually want a copy of this, uh, we can print copies up and give it to you. So uh, th this is the correct way to do it, and you should get something like that. It's still right, it's just for this guy, it's like more right because it's the correct one. Um, when you're done producing that scan, you can now go to your out the file of your previous run, make it in file, input file, and you want to save your normal modes and perform a frequency calculation. So what that involves is, you know, the usual name your check file, frequency, save normal modes, do your um, unrestricted, because that's just much nicer, you know, so, you know, give it a title, I just didn't give it a title here. So what that does is, as shown earlier uh, by uh, Kate, Kate? Okay, um, we had this nice table here of all our frequencies. Only difference is, is we have a negative frequency here. Um, that's important because that suggests a transition state. Problem, now the thing you gotta keep in mind is this is a very tiny system and I'm only dealing with the oxygen and attaching to you know, my, my carbon. It, you could have something way more complicated and you'd have several of these that which one is the right transition, you don't know. This is a simple case. We'll see what it gives us, so here we go. And this is a, and so here's my run for my money, I don't know. Oh, why did it stop? Was it that? Oh, it's a really quick movie, wow. Okay, so as you can tell, it goes back and forth, so this is, this is the, the frequency of the motion. That these guys move very little, but they do move. This one is the, the big one now. That's where we see that negative value. Now, there is one last thing I need to tell you. If we go, oh, oh that's cool. I can actually do that. Oh, okay, all right, sorry. Um, can we go back? Hello? Okay, here we go. So when you are in this position where you have more than one negative frequency, all you have to do is go back here and type in, uh, you put a TS in there. So you put a transition state. And that would find your true transition state. And there may be another keyword in there, but that's that's how you would do it in that case. Any questions? Okay, let's think. Uh, the speaker is for the presentation, and uh, paper is open for discussion. Me? <laughs> no question. Give me some time. Oh, okay. Here, I'll just play the video. <coughs> Can you uh, back, back, back? Oh. So how, 
So uh, the top curve, how uh, do you, how do you call this curve in the course? I would call this our um, especially in the first chapter of the of the course. Mm -hmm. Our our hump that we have to go over. Huh? Our our hump. Our reaction. Three, three uh, letter abbreviation. Three lever letter abbreviation. Uh-huh. What does it start with? Us. <laughs> Yes. Did oh, did see states? Yeah. Ready to do the kick. Financial engine service. Oh, now we have ripened. Okay. Okay. The wave of questions. Uh, Sarah, uh, the uh, that uh, thing that you showed us, the transition. Are you saying is that related to these graphs or something like that? Th you showed this is the vibration, right? But that, that no, that no, it's a scan of. of I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, these are the scan of the coordinates, sorry. Um, what I showed you here was the vibration. So none of the information before showed us the vibration. Okay. Yeah, sorry. No, um, no, also too, what you notice here is there's just one. You could have several different vectors and you have then you have to use that transition yeah, stage just know, like, search, the, yeah. But back and forth. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry, sorry, this just scans the, the coordinates here. The total energy just drives the word total energy. Yeah. Okay. So, you, if you were to plot this on a, a nice presentation for a publication, this would be just not choppy. You'd have more points in between. You'd have something with a nice, uh, with a nice curve. More questions? Nice. Thank you. Um, so, for transition state, should it be negative frequency or imaginary frequency, and why? It should be negative. Any other opinions? How would I know if it was imaginary? Because I just remember. <laughs> so suppose you do scan of your potential energy service, and you you would get image like this. Right? Mm. So you, you position, and here you would get. Uh, for, for your motion, you have the mass, and you have um, Hooke's law constant, mm -hmm. right? What will be the frequency? If anyone is free to, to help. Isn't it just like a product? Or like if, if you have mass and uh, the rigidity of the spring. Is it just mass type the the heavier mass will slow down the frequency. Mm -hmm. So it will be maybe the ratio. Root gamma. Huh? Root gamma. Root of gamma. M. And it should be a factor like two pi or whatever. Right? Okay, what is K? Yes, but mathematically, if you have potential U of R. Wait, number? Like you, you have potential energy surface. You found a minimum. How to find uh, rigidity then? Second term. Second term. Yeah. Second term. Yeah. Second term. Right. So if you are in the minimum, what is the sign of, of second derivative? Positive. So in minimum. So in both here you have uh, du dr uh, equals zero, but here in the maximum you also have du dr uh, zero, right? What's the difference in these two points? Sign of k. So if you uh, plug in of negative number, what's the square root of, of minus one? Huh? Square root of minus one? 
imaginary so uh, it should be um, imaginary frequency so if you are seeing that uh, your normal modes include imaginary frequencies it means that you are not in the minimum but in another extreme of condition state uh, okay. So okay so this it's, is it's a, a backwards logic okay so this is a transition right. this is for forward logic and there you see backwards logic as soon as you see imaginary frequency it means you found transition state But but question wait 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 I have a question. Yes. How, so the this are you saying this is the not the most stable what? transition state or just a transition? A transition state. A transition state. Okay. More questions to Mary. Questions one. Questions two. Questions three. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And Nathan, we will continue the rubber. And uh, we'll bring us from colorful universe of mouse operated ghost view to so back to question. What's the angle? Uh, Mass of it? Yes, out. And if, is there, uh, since there are many atoms, it's like a reduced mass. Well, okay. <clears throat> so, so far in this class, when we've uh, used Gaussian, we've been using the photon computer, um, and that has graphics forwarding, so what you can just do is type in gview.exe, and then use a GUI interface um, without a care in the world, but there are some uh, computers out there that doesn't have uh, graphical forwarding, so you have to make do without a GUI interface. So I'm going to walk you through the process of how to use it without a GUI. Okay, so you'll need some sort of starting input. Um, I decided to uh, start with an XYZ file because uh, XYZ you can uh, read with JMOL and JMOL is free, so anyone should be able to use it. Um, so the first thing you'll need to do is convert that XYZ file to a um, input file for Gaussian, uh, the COM file. So uh, we've done this before with Babel, but I thought I'd just remind you guys. Uh, you have the Babel command, you have the in dash I for input, uh, XYZ for the um, XYZ input file, the name of the file you're um, going to convert, and then dash O, COM, and then the name of the file you want it to convert to. Um, and then like before, you'll have the result, um, just a list of coordinates with some stuff up top that's specific to Gaussian, but still there's a problem um, uh, with any calculation you want to run with Gaussian. Uh, you'll need to specify some information, and the file I just showed you on the previous slide doesn't have that. So you'll need to <coughs> figure out what to put in that header up top of the file for that. Um, on the photon computer in uh, the file bin, uh, so to get there just type tilde dash bin. There's going to be a, a file called header underscore hf. That's just a template header for the Hartree Fock uh, functional for a Gaussian file. Um, I have a picture of it just right here. Um, all this stuff is what you're going to have to edit, but I'll show you how to do that later for now. I'm just going to show you how to take this header and put it into the file you um, just created previously. Uh, to do that, there's a command in Linux called cat. Um, it just takes two files and puts them together. What's so, the connection between this command and uh, any more? Um, very <laughs> little. It's short for a concatenation. So, um, um, you just look at the command cat, it, that just tells you you want to use um, that. Uh, process of taking two files and putting them together. And then uh, the first one, the first thing after that, uh, you want the first file. Uh, that's important because the order matters. If you switch head underscore hf, which is this header, and um, the example, which is the coordinates around, you'll get the coordinates up top and the header up the, on the bottom. And that's not really what you want out of a header. <laughs> so just get 
get the order right, and then you have this right forward, uh, this caret facing to the right, that just tells you that you want to uh, put these two files together and put an output, and then to the right of the caret is what you want to call the output. So if you do all that, um, you should have something like this. It's the file from before, but this time it has the header at the top. Um, from here, you just need to make sense of what's up here in the header and how to edit that um, to get what you want out of it. Uh, the first line, um, it just specifies the uh, check file. So that's one of the output files you get when you run a job. It just, uh, you tell it um, what to call it and then after the job's finished, it'll put that check file in the directory. Um, the next two lines, memory and processors, that just sets how much, uh, how many resources you want for a given um, job. So in this class, we haven't really done any of that, or at least I haven't. Um, but um, personally, when I've used, uh, in my research on VASP, I've actually had to care about that, specifically the number of processors. If I used more than one, a job would crash just like 10 minutes in, so I had to actually manually change that. So all you really have to do is just t uh, change the number. If you want to change it to one processor, just put one. It's pretty easy. And then the next line, um, this ha uh, hashtag P, uh, that tells uh, Gaussian that you want some extra output. Um, the HF, that stands for Hartree Fock. Uh, if you want to use something else, you'll have to look up the tag and put that in there. Um, as a disclaimer, I don't really know what um, all the tags are. There's a bunch of them. You'll have to look them up anytime you want to use it. And then right after HF, there's the dash lanl 2 dz That's just the basis set you want to use. Again, there's tags for all different sorts of basis sets. Um, so just figure out what the tag is for the one you want to use and put it in there. And next is no sim. Uh, so what I was able to find is that Gaussian, if you enable symmetry, it'll like change the coordinate system of uh, your structure throughout the um, throughout the calculation. And just putting no sim doesn't let it do that. It keeps the uh, uh, same coordinate system throughout. Um, and then there's this cache size. Um, that's more resources, but I really. Uh, even outside of this class, I've never had to worry about the cache or something. But if you do need to change it, just change the number. Um, and then down here, the uh, zero one that specifies the charge and multiplicity. So um, with this one, um, there's zero charge and it's in a singlet state. That's what the one is for. Um, if it was a doublet, it'd be a two. So, but um, and then once you have that, um, it should be good to go. And to submit it, you just want to type geo9 for Gaussian 9 and then the name of the input file. And then after it's finished computing, um, just type ls-lt, and you can see the files that it uh, out, put out for you up top. But that's all I have. OK, good fun. Hey. There is a line. Yes. at the bottom. Um, I think I read somewhere that there has to be like three hard spaces at the bottom, but I never tried it without it, so I can't confirm that it's did, did it work for you without putting space at the bottom? Um, I didn't try it without putting space on so but I've heard that there is a problem, I just can't confirm it. More questions? Can you throw the thing play from the screen? So Kurt, we will uh, continue the story. Uh, what to do if uh, yeah, if uh, we do have all the command line text information and no graphics on one hand, and if you have uh, high performance production of more than that. I'll try to model my way through operating Gaussian on, on CCAST. 
CCAST is the Center for Computationally Assisted Science and Technology. Uh, to obtain access to the CCAST server, you'll need to go to that website link there, and they have a nice little form where you'll need to enter your name, your email, a sponsor, and then the actual software you, you want to use. So, correct me if I'm wrong, we just have CCAS 9 on there, or do they have 16 on there? Is, or Gaussian 9 on there? They have 16, 16 on there? Okay. Um, how this kind of differs from normal computing. So, if your personal computer is like a Toyota Corolla, it's it was engineered with a user oriented design, it's designed to be easy to use, everything should be fairly intuitive. Photon would be more like a race car, and then when we get into the actual high performance computing, now we're getting into like rocket cars. Things that go wrong can go wrong very, very fast, and they can lead to a lot of complications and at least lots of headaches for system administrators and yourself. So if you are using these systems and need help, make sure that you can contact the support there at support at ccast.nbc.edu. Um, so the the batch scripting is done with an open source variant of the PBS software. PBS is a portable batch, portable batch system. All your commands will be PBS in the actual script file itself, if I remember correctly. Um, one of the advantages of this is it can email you when your job starts, when your job's completed, and if it errors, and if it errors out. You can also specify the input the output file locations and specify what kind of resources you'd like to have utilized for this the job you're trying to run. So here's an example of a, of a little PBS script. So it has So like a clock, imagine like a clock on a wall. So that'll be how much time you're willing to devote to this project, the amount of RAM you would like to have for this project. Questions. Uh, interactive and non-interactive jobs. So an interactive job, you're going to have the shell open the whole time the job is running, and you're going to be able to specify. You might have some, if, if, if it's running as a shell, you'll have some interactive abilities, so you might request variables. It's more helpful when you're debugging, debugging software, non-interactive jobs, or the ones you submit via the scripts, and from the looks of it, from the way this, from the way CCAST is set up, it'll give you access to more resources than if you're trying to do an interactive job. Uh, monitoring jobs. This XD mod, I have not used it a whole lot. It seems very similar to very similar to Zabbix, although it gives you more more information on the on the clusters overall. And if I remember correctly, there is a jobs tab in there. And then there's also a command QStat that I found out about not uh, a few minutes ago when looking for emails, and that can give you information specifically. On your on your jobs. Are you done? Uh, I, I believe so. Okay, I'm let's thank uh, Mark. Okay. Uh -huh. A stream of questions for me. What, what is a shell? What? What is a shell? Uh, a shell is that is the user is the user interface you have on your local terminal or local computer. All of the. It's the it's the command the command line interface. Yep, yep. More questions. Uh, especially those who uh, run Gaussian and Cicast, please try to torture code. Okay, so <laughs> When 
you need when you say more space, do you mean like more space? Like, so if we notice here, are we using thunder or cluster three? Or both? Thunder. thunder? Okay. Well, looks like you can, depending upon which execution queue you go into, you can choose the number of cores you have and the number of powers you have. On thunder, it looks like there's even more delineation as to what resources are available to different types of jobs. So I kind of I'm not overly familiar with the exact setup of, of these systems. Yes? Okay. What is the mathematical equation for Gaussian scale up, like in terms of the, pro the time you give for, there's a mathematical equation for that, right? Big, big O operations? Uh, it's like. Yes. Or and uh, and as can can explain why the formulation question is incorrect. Oh. <laughs> uh, what is there is like a scale of like how much memory you can assign something depending on how big your job is. There's like a relationship between the two. I thought there was uh, just the amount of time that it takes. No, no, no. Those jobs really need uh, memory. There are some beautiful uh, relations, but it, it differs uh, substantially from method to method. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Method and base set. So it's uh, uh, not the size of the system, but most of the base set is not Yes, saving is the, the cheapest of the three structures. Yes. Yes. Uh, who did? Who has? Well, experience finding those in the who has not? You know, one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six. Okay, so question to Kurt uh, just uh, where to start from if he wants to run something on uh, run those in the uh, Well, first you need to gain access to it. Um, Suppose well, everyone in the class is expected to oh, have uh, access. send okay. email. You were showing in one of the slides the e email. So send email to support that you need. And, uh, at least by the time when projects will start, you should have. Okay. What, what else? Um, so a after we make our account, um, can we use that example batch script um, as a template, you know, to like figure out what code to write to like run Gaussian on Ccast? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, different, different questions. So who, who thinks that we cannot and explain why? Okay, this because we run on a batch system. No, 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 no. Well, just administratively, not uh, physical computation. Oh, because of the nodes, because the. Uh, oh. So uh, you need to request this form, sign it, and send it back to administrators. If you do not do it, then your account will not see if you uh, run this batch scripts. They tell, I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have Gaussian tool. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So they, they so manually, uh, you, you just tell that you are not going to do bad things, and they allow you to. Also, before I run that batch group template he has, I have to fill out the form and send Yes, it. you need to request right. this form, sign it, and send it to them. Okay. Right. And and the, when you do the, the thing, filling out the form, you have to request Gaussian. Okay. It's a special, and then they give you the form to sign. All right. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Uh, more questions to uh, 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 to Kurt or anyone? <laughs> no. Okay. Let's thank him once again. And before the next uh, presenter, we will take the stage and just quickly uh, go through. So after you sign uh, the form, there are examples of, of batch scripts which are a little yes. longer than those that uh, Kurt was showing general script, and here are uh, they will be recorded. Examples of um, the uh, I can't share what? My batch huh? I can share my please, batch. please do. And what is um, important in the script? There should be command model load uh, Gaussian. Uh, if you didn't sign the form, uh, it will give you error here. It will not load the model. And uh, there is also a big. Um,
amount, not you, big amount of um, of the script that deals with uh, distributing your question o over several nodes. If you are just doing like methane molecule, you don't need it. Yes? And you have to run scratch. It is included here. Okay. It, it doesn't scratch. And actual uh, command is, is here. Right? So um, the script will understand that G16 is executing of Gaussian only if uh, you put this command and only if you are included into Gaussian uh, group. Uh, so after you after you have it, so you create your PBS script, you submit it with the command qsub, as Kurt may have mentioned, right? And then uh, after it is uh, submitted, you check whether it, it is running with uh, qstat command, with which Kurt also mentioned. And if you don't care what other people uh, are doing right now, if you're looking only selfish, you just put minus U and your username. Otherwise, it will garbage your screen with uh, uh, 3,000 other jobs that have been submitted. And then it shows that some jobs are in the queue status, and some jobs are in the running status. OK? So I don't care for the, for the, for the course and for, for instruction, but you may care for completion of your project or for later use of Gaussian for your uh, research. So submitting so R means good. OK. And the next presenter will be Queenie. <laughs> So he's uh, staying on the glorious path of using software without graphical. Yeah. Well, we've all done this in class, so this will be pretty fast. So, uh, so what I'm going to be doing is uh, analyze Geo9 output without Gauss view. <laughs> 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 okay, so yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, just going to get to the point here uh, from the last lecture that uh, Dimitri told us about, uh, he did mention that the ionization energy is equal to homo and the electron affinity is equal to lumo. And uh, also, I'll be trying to sh show like the whole gap and uh, the total energy from this presentation. So, like usual, you know, go to G view. Yeah, um, this is a light stuff. Okay, yeah. So you go to G view, the DXE, right? You make your um, make your compound. And uh, then you exit, and then you uh, process that your compound. You use the uh, GL9 function on your compound. And in my situation, I named my compound COEX.com. Oh, yeah, and also uh, you also save it as a .com file from the uh, G view. And uh, then you type more just to like see what you've created in your file. And uh, it shows you the uh, partition coordinates so far because you haven't really done much on it. And then uh, you type ls. This is really funny. Anyways, you type ls to find out what files have been made after you uh, use the geo9 function. And uh, these are all the files, but we can see right here the file I made and the new files that were made after using my GL9 function on my uh, compound. And uh, <laughs> then you type. <laughs> so to get your uh, whole energy, your final energy, your gap energy, you can uh, type this function down. And you also have your uh, compound name. 
from God's view in that log. And uh, here you have uh, 2000 is the number of energy steps you're using. And uh, 10 is uh, it's more like a grid kind of away and above the homo lumo, just like it's explained here. So down from homo, 10. Up from the mountain, so that what that's what it means there. And the width of the gauss, zero point one, that's what it means there. So after you type that and you push enter, and uh, it brings up this information. And from here you can, I feel this is another way you can get your homo lumo energies too, because down here it gives you the. Uh, Homo and it gives you the Lumo energy. It also gives you the uh, gap energy as well down there. And uh, it gives you the initial energy of your system and the final energy of your system down there. And then uh, after that, you can type LS again, find out the new files that have been made after this function right here. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just a good way of keeping track of you know what files have been made and what files are so and then uh, after that you type more okay so back here we see that a log file okay we see that a log file wasn't the e log file isn't made here and over here uh, I think I skipped something Okay, so after that, you come over here to the new files that have been made and you type. So this is another way of figuring out the, uh, the homo lumo by um, where you have the changes right there, right? So you type more e call the uh, name of your file dot log and then you can get this, your homo lumo in this way where we have uh, it corresponds to like the last information that was given to us here. Like here we have a uh, homo 11 and lumo 3. And here we have homo 11 and lumo 3 just as well. But this is just another way of like figuring out your homo lumo. And, uh, and then you can do the gap method too, the way you have the gap. So uh, you go more your uh, compound name dot log. And this one is quite different from the other one because here I did more e energy compound name dot log, and here I just did more compound name dot log. And here you use the gaps to like figure out, like uh, Dimitri said in class, you can just count it. Like so, I have one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, right? And uh, here it goes all the way down to eight as well, which matches it. So this is another way of figuring out your uh, homo lumo too. And uh, yeah, so also now you can now, um, so we want to like copy the files we've made so far from this process to another uh, format so we can like get like a energy states and uh, get a PDF you know, version like what we did in class. We all did this. So uh, you use this function cp does w01 your compound name log does the log. Right, and then I think uh, more files are being created there because of that function. And uh, then you use the GNU plug command to uh, plot your energy states. And uh, after that, you change the format using this function here. And uh, after that, you save it on your desktop, and it saves as a PDF format. And you can get pictures as nice as this one. So, yeah.
just trying to say from here it's just like a like self a direction for myself to like you know talk about pretty much so so find homo lumo you come all the way down <laughs> here when you change when it goes from negative to a positive you find so it's um so highest occupied right? oh volunteer orbital yeah okay so that's is that what you want to Can you point to the homo? Okay. And Lumo is lowest occupied molecular, molecular orbital. Most unoccupied. Un unoccupied, yeah. Un yeah, so. So where's that at then? Occupied or unoccupied by what? By electrons? Yes. And uh, your column number four in your file. That shows two or zero. What would two or zero what? Uh, two, I believe that should be. Electron? Yeah, electrons. I guess. But it's not atoms, not orange. It's <laughs> not orange. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, when you track down for this eight orbitals, they all have two electrons. They are orbitals are occupied by electrons. Okay. And you count, count, count until you have it is the last one that is occupied. Okay. Or highest that is occupied. Yeah, which is when you jump one. to the next step, it it's starts zero, zero, zero. It lowest is, uh, unoccupied. Lowest unoccupied. Yeah. By electrons. By electrons. Okay. Uh -huh. So lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals by electrons. Okay. Wait, um, I'm sorry for more questions, but right. I don't understand what the first like one, two, three? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think these are the energies right okay. here. Right? I'm not too sure what this one was, <coughs> no, but I do know that this is the energy, and here it's showing the number of electrons. Okay. All right. Well, if you look at the very bottom row, it tells you what the four columns are. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> what? Okay, so you said energy. Yeah, but what is the A that you abbreviation? It's there? a it's a unit. Atomic unit. Oh, oh, so it's oh. It's a conversion. Okay. Oh, okay. So what what's the factor of conversion between uh, Kelvin and Boltzmann and Kelvin units? Roughly. What is bigger, Kelvin volt or atomic unit? Well, apparently electron volts are bigger here. Uh huh. Oh, here? No, no. They have like larger numerical value. But there's, there's like, mm, what, what, what is Oh, you mean like conversion? What is more expensive, one cent or one dollar? Well, okay, so just going based off this, I could tell that atomic unit is bigger because if you're converting, yes. it becomes smaller. So it means some kind of, the division that makes it. 27 times. Yeah, so. So atomic unit is 27 times more expensive than. Uh, Ten. So if you multiply this by 27, you get that. Okay. Well, is there more scrutinizing the questions? <laughs> <laughs> you say? What? It, it is a question of Kevin. What is the first pool? <coughs> it says the state. So it's just a uh, number of orbitals. You count them. So yeah, it goes all the way to eight. So eight orbitals. And then you have a 
two electrons in each orbital. Nathan wanted to uh, ask something. He already answered it. It was about the units of the energy. Oh. Okay. So it's good to nice. Oh, another. Yeah, I just want no. I just want to clarify something real quick. So the highest occupied molecular orbital is the orbital with the highest number of electrons and the highest energy, right? No. It's not the one with the highest energy. Okay. Uh, I, I want you to continue this question. If you look on energies of orbitals, starting yeah. from one and going down to the list, what do energies do? Are they growing or decreasing? They're decreasing. From one? No, no, no. There is a minus sign in front. It starts from like minus 100. And then it goes minus 20, and then it goes to zero. Are we going to ignore them? No. The energies are getting bigger as you go down the list. Right? More negative, yeah, but smaller. So as it's getting less negative, it's getting bigger. Oh, OK. okay. So All as right. you go from 1 to 10 and further, energies increase. So we're going to ignore the magnitude and just go by the signs. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Absolute value. Uh, not absolute value, but uh, the take into account the sign. The sign, okay. Like the direction on the number line, if it's to the right, it's bigger, if it's slower. Oh, okay, all right. So as you go uh, further and further onto the list, energy grows. Okay. And then you observe simultaneously energy, uh, which grows, and occupation. So just as he is just said, it means uh, eight right here is the highest so far. It's the highest out of those that are occupied by electrons. By electrons, okay. So you were right, yeah. But it could be a different state, depending on your system. Yes, but uh, that, uh, right now, as I interpret the question by uh, Kevin, we are trying to be very strict with verbal definitions, like the uh, highest among whom? Among those that are occupied by electrons. More questions to Kvini? I'll scrutinize it. <laughs> the <laughs> thank you once again. <laughs> and the next presentation is by Kevin. So he will uh, tell us a little bit more um, how to convert numbers into images. And uh, he kind of revives us and, and, and bring um, back from um, boring numbers to exciting images, specifically related to basic space. Um, all right, guys, so this is like a de density of states. I've designed this presentation to be like really short, just to get the bare bones of what you need, a little reminder of what density of states are, and um, a, a little code you can use as a template. Um, Okay, so before I get into go to the code, let's talk about uh, what is a density of states. Uh, density of states is basically a plot showing the number of states, uh, excuse me, per an energy per energy level or like an yeah an energy interval. And this is like uh, an equation like showing the mathematical definition of a density of states. Now, why is uh, de density of states relevant? Um, if we remember in a quantum mechanics, which is basically like uh, part of what we're studying, energy is is quantized and, and discrete. So in regular classical mechanics, energy can go from like point zero zero one, and then it, it it gradually like increases or decreases. But in quantum mechanics, energy uh, jumps straight from like one energy level to another. There's like uh, no no in in between. Now, um, for those of you who took uh, statistical me mechanics, um, I just want to like uh, throw this like a quick uh, aside. So we've all studied, you know, microstates and uh, ma macrostates. If you remember from statistical uh, me mechanics, uh, the micro, the macrostate with the highest number of uh, microstates, it, that's really going to be the the most probable uh, macrostate, the one that has the, the most microstates. Um, it's the same idea here for um, density of states. The reason density of states is uh, important is because uh, basically the energy interval with the highest number of states 
that's ba basically the most uh, probable like uh, energy we'll we'll get basically. So that's the basic idea of that. Okay, um, script for plotting um, de density of states. Um, I've designed this slide for you guys to use as a as a template. So if you like re don't remember anything from about how we plotted um, density of states, you can just uh, download uh, my my slide and just literally like copy this code and use it as a template, and then you'll get your uh, uh, density of state plot. So here in, in the first uh, two, two lines, uh, we're, we're bringing up the code needed to make our uh, .log file. Uh, this is related to what uh, Queenie did uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation. Right here, wh where, my point, where my pointer is, is a dot, dot .log file uh, where we're using. Um, okay, and then in, on this third line, we're, we're copying our uh, dot .log file, we're copying this, and then uh, we're, we're making a new one that's just named dos.log. Um, in this line, we're uh, actually literally uh, making the, the density uh, of state plot. Um, and then um, this line here is, is a conversion. We're basically converting from a PS to a, a PDF, and we're and we're using this uh, DOS uh, uh, file under that. And then the, the rest uh, of this code, the last three lines, is basically um, what you do to, to basically uh, access uh, your, your density uh, of states uh, plot. You may not necessarily have to use these uh, la last three lines of code. If you remember on the MOMA X term like interface uh, on the left hand side, it shows a bunch of these folders. Uh, so if you have have a mouse and a graphical interface, you can just like click on the new PDF file you made, and um, it it should open it. Uh, so yeah, like I said at, at the beginning, if you don't remember anything about how to plot density of states, just like uh, download my slide and just to uh, copy this code, and um, and um, you know if you follow it, and you may have to make a couple of minor modifications, uh, you'll get a density of state plot. And here's like a quick, quick example. Uh, density of states is on the y-axis. Orbital energy is, is on the, the x-axis. It's in uh, el electron volts. And, um, and the, the states with negative 20, negative 15, and um, 0, they're, they're the most probable because they're the ones with the highest uh, number of, of states. So this is just a quick example of how, how we'd use a density of state plot. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, three questions. First, was, uh, this time was Nathan. Second, very third, uh, Ben. On your first slide, you talked about discrete energy level. Mm -hmm. So when you're using a density of states, do you have to like consider discrete energy levels, or can you do it continuously? Um, the density of states plot is always you know, going to be um, di discrete, because mm -hmm. We're not using a classical me mechanics. We're using a quantum mechanics, and in quantum me uh, me mechanics and in quantum uh, chemistry, which is what we're studying, energy is always discrete. On your last slide, you have a plot of the density of states, and it looks really continuous to me. Hmm. Um, like the actual line, like there's gaps. But. All right. Uh, maybe I, I made a mistake in making that a density of, of state plot. Mm -hmm. No mistakes, uh, no mistakes. No mistakes. So like, uh, you can get that discrete value if you uh, uh, reduce the line width. So you, as it, it's a higher line, so it's getting a, a continuous. It seems like continuous, but it's discrete. So if you reduce the line, then you can find the discrete. So that's my smaller system to larger system, uh, there is a trend. The larger the system, the larger number of electrons, the larger number of states, and the higher the more continuous density is. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the example that Kevin is showing is a really small uh, system on the molecular side for uh, as, as, as you will go to heavier system, it will become more and more uh, what is your band gap when you're density of states? I 
And how do you know if that's the right band? Well, correct. What would have been the other for the model? To the model. I I don't remember what the specific uh, band gap is for this. Okay. Ask Queenie. He gave us a lecture on what is band gap. Yes. Yeah. So um. And uh, Queenie, what 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 is the gap on this image that uh, Kevin is showing? Well, you have to go back to the function. I just roughly, roughly. It's about mega 15. Oh, 15. Well, 15. 15. 15. 15. 10. I would say 13. 13. Yeah, 13. Okay. So you, you just measure offset from occupied to unoccupied, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did, how'd you get the one and two? You, you actually answered my question. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I need to leave that. Um, I didn't actually uh, make, make well, this. Oh, you didn't make that one? So no. what, what's the one and two correspond to? Uh, they correspond uh, to something special, right? right? I'm not re really sure. Uh, based on all your previous lines, it's likely yes. they didn't affect your side. All right. So really small, however, nine at the moment. More questions? You can always thank Kevin and Steve. Sulipto Sapo is the next presenter, and we need to finish three presentations in 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, there are two, 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 uh, like two aspects of continuity. First, yeah. if there is a <coughs> lot of levels, <coughs> and second, if we artificially add volume, that we will uh, make it continuous even if they ask parts. Okay, so after so many hard topics, maybe I am going to uh, present the easiest one. <laughs> so, I am basically going to present uh, GNU plot software and how to use that for plotting different numerical data. So, uh, what is the GNU plot software? That uh, This software is uh, quite uh, useful one. I, I, I found this software super useful for me and for my research. Maybe you guys will also find it super useful and this one is free, and the most important thing and it can uh, it can do both interactive and batch modes. So batch mode of operation. So this one is quite user friendly. I found it user friendly. So uh, in this software, uh, how we usually plot uh, data. So what we can do, sorry. Suppose uh, I'm trying to plot a function. Uh, suppose uh, my function is like f of x is equal to e to the power minus x squared divided by 2. By the way, uh, in this software, it cannot consider that power sign. So if you want to uh, make a power sign, you'll have to put double star. So in this way, it usually considers power. So suppose this is my function, and I want to plot it. So the command I will give in the software, like just plot. And suppose in my x axis, I want to make uh, like make the variables named not x. It should be t. So I am setting the variables in t for minus 4 to 4, and then f of t. Then it will plot my function. And if I want to plot another another function on the same graph, then I will just add another function like t squared divided by 16. Then it will plot both the function in the same curve. And suppose uh, I am done with plotting the software, uh, plotting the curves or the main function, the, like this is the preliminary step. I want to plot one function, or I want to plot two functions at a time. Now I want to set some le uh, levels, set x levels, y levels, or titles. Uh, these things are pretty simple one. I, I can give commands like set title, set x level, set y level. And if I want to see the grids, I can use set grid. And after uh, giving this command, I want to plot it again, just uh, replot. And uh, before replot, you can uh, common like reset, and then it will remove the previous curve and it it will replot. So th this is how we can plot a function. But if we have some data, like usually we deal with data, we have a uh, couple of data that we want to plot, like density of state, or there are many other ways. Like I want to plot e k curve, or many other things we want to plot. So how we can plot data? So before to plot a data, you will have to write all the data in one text file, and then 
uh, like there in the in that text file there are there may be several columns like one column for independent variables and two and the second or third or fourth columns those can be of dependent variables and you can choose which column you want to use so and uh, there should be no uh, there should be uh, you can add comma comments with that uh, that sign uh, you cannot see it here but uh, it's in the slide so you can use that uh, this sign so you can add comments with this sign I don't know the name of this sign hashtag. but hashtag thank you so and uh, if you uh, and each of the fields should be separated by a tab and so after entering the data into a text file you can plot it how you can plot it just uh, this one is pretty simple one like you will just give a comment uh, like plot my file name dot data or whatever dot t uh, txt and you can set the title like title name uh, what you want to give as a title and uh, like it is pretty common that we want to consider the uh, uncertainties in the dependent variable and we can set it with the y error bars and if we set it with uh, with y error bars then it will consider the uh, uncertainty of the dependent variable with respect to the independent variables and we can also uh, include x errors by x error bars or both x and y axis errors with x or error bars and uh, this is another very useful tool while using uh, this uh, GNU plot software that is using suppose I have a curve uh, I have a text file with three or four columns and in that curve like in that file the first column is of uh, I want to make it dependent variable or I want to make it a uh, y axis and the second column I want to make it my x axis. So how we can do that? Like just plot that file name using two is to one. This two is to one means it will make the second column as your independent variable like x axis and the first column as your uh, dependent variable like y axis. And suppose I want to uh, plot uh, like I have three columns and I want to plot uh, two curves at a time. Well, first one is like uh, keeping the independent variable in x axis. One curve should be one is to two and the se second curve should be one is to three. Then things are pretty simple. Like I am just giving one command like plot uh, double dot data whatever the file name using one is to two and I am making the title that like this is series one. And then uh, another comment uh, with a comma I can give another comment like double data using one is to three. So if we see a car here, so it should, I, I made a mm, file for myself just to see what happens here. So uh, with that uh, with that command, uh, I, I have found that this is one is to one is to two for this one and one is to three for this one. So in this way we can, we can plot uh, several data in one curve and if we want to plot uh, different data in different curves we can use that using function and we can subplot at a time so these things are uh, pretty simple and uh, suppose uh, you, you cannot see it here so the column is uh, basically mentioned by uh, this dollar sign so dollar one means first column dollar two means second column dollar three means third column so if you want to uh, modify it, kind of, you can give up comment like plot, uh, whatever it is, the file name, using one is to uh, log dollar two. So it will take the uh, logarithm of second column and then it will plot it against first column so these are the uh, these are the pretty uh, useful tools and there are many other comments uh, we can be, like whatever we want we can just search online and I am just uh, giving a brief uh, introduction to this software that these are the things and if you want you can uh, search online what command you need for your purpose so if we want to use this software for plotting density of states uh, we can easily do that like uh, 
first first of all we will have to uh, rename the dos data file as dos dot log and making it a log file then we can uh, it can be downloaded to plot on excel also and then we are calling the gnu plot software and we are uh, calling the script to plot the dos data so it's uh, on that comment and here in this line what we are doing uh, like set term post line width we are setting the line width 4 and we are setting the uh, font as helvetica and we are setting uh, like we are setting all these things like x levels y levels and then we are giving a comment like plot dos dot plot and use u means basically using and 1 is to 2 means x axis and y axis with line if we uh, if we use wp then it will not create any line it will rather create po uh, points and it will not add those points so if we want to add the points then we will use with line and if we want to uh, see these things uh, as a pdf form or we can convert the uh, ps file to a pdf file using this command and we can also download this pdf file for our purpose and here I have uh, created the dot, uh, density of state function for H2O and uh, the, I cannot measure the band gap, but this one is the conduction band, this one is the valence band, the gap, opposite. oh sorry, this one is the valence band, this one is the conduction band and the gap between the conduction band and valence band should be the band gap. So that and uh, we have plotted that using the Gnu software. So, in conclusion, I can say that I found this software really very helpful. It can be used for plotting the uh, different types of 2D or 3D curves. And Gnu Pro software, all, it's really easy to use. That I found it useful. So, thank you. Yeah. That's the most interesting thing. Glue means free. Glue and software that's spelled with glue. Kevin, uh, can you go back to the second to last slide? This one? Yeah, that one. All right, so the, that huge space in the middle where from negative 10 to 0 to where that first line began, that's the band gap. As you said, to the, right, to the right hand side of that is conduction or valence? Uh, conduction. Okay, and to the left is valence. Okay. And so uh, in old books, right now the, the terminology changes, but uh, there were like three bands: conduction band, valence band, and forbidden band. Yes. Like what we call band gap is forbidden band yes. because there are no states there. Okay. Like in China, forbidden city. Alright. <laughs> more questions to Zudita? Uh, I have one more yeah, question. Sure. So uh, instead of using like G A. And you thought, why can't I just you know export all, all of my data and just like make a graph in Excel? Why is this better than like using Excel and plot? So, uh, why is GNU plot better than using Excel? Mm. Good question. It's quicker. Okay. You can do this all the time. Like usually, uh, I found that in different literature papers they use this type of softwares, not the Excel. Okay. Excel's, I don't think it's, if you're going to have to import Maybe it, you have to export the data. If this one, you just put do, 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 and you're done. Okay. Yep. More questions? If no, thanks to you for once again. And uh, David and me will uh, show us how to make two presentations in eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I would be taking this class, I would select the same uh, subject as, as David because it is. Uh, That's why David us. picked first. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to show you how to make or plot molecular orbitals. So the first step in the process is to com convert your checkpoint file that you get. That's you get all when you run up Gaussian into the formatted checkpoint file, and you do that with the form check command. So you type in your command and type your the file you're going to convert and then the file name you want it to become. 
So you also, at this point, you need to choose the orbitals you want to, to pick. So this is the same file that Queenie showed us earlier. And I have highlighted here, you can't see the occupancy, but I have the homo and the lumo circled here. So if it has a two, it's occupied, and where it switches from two to zero is the homo lumo. And I also showed over here from the log file where you can see that. So it switches from occupied to virtual. So if you were to count all these up, you could find out what your homo orbital is. So then you need to generate a cube file from the formatted checkpoint file. And we do do that with the cube gen command. So if you notice here, I made uh, files for the homo and the homo minus one orbitals. And you type cube gen, the O, then your molecular orbital number, the form formatted checkpoint file and your output file. And the area that I have boxed here in red, there are several different options you can use. So what I have here is MO equals N, which lets us specify which specific molecular orbital we're looking at. Um, you could also use AMO and BMO equals N. Those will select the alpha or the beta spin occupancy orbitals. So then to actually make your uh, molecular orbital, you need to come into Gauss view, you go to results, you go to surface and contours here, and that'll open up this window. From here you go to surface actions and click new surface, and it'll give you a, a uh, molecular uh, orbital diagram like this. And there are a few options down here that you can change to adjust how it looks, like the ISO value here. Um, and they just that will just change the size of the clouds. So then the other thing to, to look at here is the open shell configuration. So that indicates that we have unpaired electrons. So I'm using hexa aqua titanium three here, which has an electron configuration of argon 3D one. So if you go into our input file that I want to say Nathan was looking at, you can see that my multiplicity is, dub is a doublet here. So that's going to give us our alpha and our beta orbitals. So then just like we did here we make cube gen, except here we would use AMO and BMO to find it. And then we actually plot them, they will have differences. So these are orientated in the same frame of reference. And you have your alpha molecular orbital and your beta molecular orbital. So the same number. So in this case, the beta was orbital 34, the alpha was orbital 35. Pretty sure it was 34 and 35. Oh, yeah, it's homo. Yes, this is, this is the homo. Homo of beta is uh, p orbital of oxygen, and uh, homo of alpha is d uh, orbital. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. This is the last one? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Any good questions while he is uh, turning back? If you will, thank you once again. And uh, there will be our champion. Coach. Change Shop presentation. Change PowerPoint, so. Change PowerPoint. Uh, me will show the <coughs> uh, presentation in two minutes, or one minute and 30 seconds. Well, let's it's pretty quick. A lot of this information that uh, people have provided to today kind of helps set up where I'm at. 
So electrostatic potential, molecular charge, and isosurfaces. Uh, just earlier, um, comment that uh, David had just said, form check files earlier, uh, I believe Anas had gone over how to calculate, optimize, and in our case we did DF, in my case I did DFT and then LSDA, you guys should be able to see that on your sheet of paper. Um, uh, so this is for the electrostatic potential, uh, we talked about uh, some coding we were using, we need uh, cube gen files, or F check, cube, we, excuse me, we need cube files, we can get that with F check and cube generation. And I have the code written on here so you guys can use it for later. And this is supposed to be the values we get. Once we go to the results, click surfaces contours, and if we want to click on, uh, excuse me, right here. And once that comes up, you have this information, you press OK, and this value comes up. Um, I tried changing some of these values, and they were supposed to change the figure, but they never did. So I don't know if I have my situation had issues or not. Uh, and then this is the Mulliken charge visualization. With Visualization, all it does is tell you the charge. Green is positive, red is negative. Easy. Uh, once again, we go to results again. This is where all our information comes from. <coughs> That's why we calculated stuff earlier. And I love the smiley, just for you, Kevin. And uh, we want to make sure we go to the click charge distribution in the results section and uncheck these. So I believe one of them is checked and the two usually aren't, but just make sure they aren't. Okay. Uh, you can change formatting as well. Um, and then. Uh, this for ISO services, we had done this, we need log files, and uh, I do want to kind of show that uh, I, I want to know what the ISO surface tells you what value through the contour surface, but I don't know what I was looking at, if it was like electronegativity or magnetism of some sort, I apologize. And then so happened to look like Zoidberg, so I put that on. That's it. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, let me suggest to ask him questions by email because uh, we are running out of uh, yes. time and some of you have uh, uh, responsibilities, drives, and uh, dinner. And dinner <laughs> yes. So many thanks to, for, to all presenters. Uh, this session will be uh, available online, hopefully. And uh, looking forward to see you tomorrow at 5, same place.